ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Black Baseball Mixtape, and this is Mixtape Talk. I am honored to be joined by a newly named Black head coach in Division I baseball, head coach of the Memphis Tigers, Keurig Jackson. Coach Jackson, welcome to the welcome to the mixtape. I'm so excited to have you on. Appreciate it, Sheets. Appreciate you having me on. So I've got a I got a number of questions, but the one that stands out to lead this is that when you were announced at a actually a pretty big press conference for a baseball head coach to be named, um, you became visibly emotional. Visibly emotional at being named the head coach of Memphis baseball. Now, in my mind, I could have went a million different ways as to why that is. You're the first black head coach in the history of Memphis baseball. You are only one of, at the time, four D1 baseball coaches that were, uh, I believe it was outside of HBCUs. Uh, There's just so many reasons why you would be emotional but, but at the press conference for being announced for this job. But I want you to take me behind the curtain in regards to you understanding the magnitude of the moment and getting choked up a little bit when you were named a head coach of Memphis baseball, take me behind the curtain. And, and what was that like for you? Yeah. You know what? It was, uh, it was one of the reporters asked me the question uh, and she, she basically said, you know, knowing that you are the first black head baseball coach at the university of Memphis, right. what does that mean? Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know how much you know about me and my career and what I've done. And, but a lot, mission, we're going to get into yeah. all of it. We're going to get into all yeah. of it, but, but the audience does it. So break it right. down for us. Yeah. So, I mean, my, my mission has, has kind of been in this whole thing is to create more opportunities for players and minority coaches. And so the idea of, of getting this position, uh, here, um, in a community that is 65% black. Uh, on a 40 percent minority dominated campus um, in what is arguably uh, one of the the top leagues for baseball in the country um, that just says a lot right it said a lot for the administration and Laird Veach our AD and Blair DeBoard our associate AD who is the baseball administrator to have said this is the guy that is going to take this program uh, to the to the levels uh, that that we expect that it can reach, um, and so when you just look at that, and, and like you said at the time, um, I was the third, right? There was two, right. um, and then and then shortly after uh, Blake Beamer got hired, and then shortly after um, Lance got hired, right. um, and so you know you, we go from two to three to five, all within about a two month time span. Um, and, and I tell people like, listen, I don't, I don't think that Blake got his job or Lance got their jobs because of, of me. But what I do believe is that some of those ADs may have been looking and saying, well, wait a minute now, if Memphis, who's in the American, which is a, again, a very credible, um, and one of the top leagues, uh, baseball leagues in the country is hiring a black coach, we may need to open up our search and look at some different things. Um, and so it was just a, yeah, it was just a, a moment when you think about um, when those things happen, you know, when I tell some of our players, how often do you have an opportunity to be part of history? And, and when, and when you realize that that's what it is, you're part of history, that you're, you're part of something that will forever be remembered. It's, that is a very humbling uh, experience uh, and feeling, and it comes with a, a, a huge responsibility. No, you're exactly right. And your journey, your personal journey, is unlike any of the coaches I've even followed or even the coaches that you've named. You've coached b- baseball, college baseball at every level. You've taken time away from coaching to stay involved in the game and do things like uh, be a professional scout, a professional agent, and head the MLB draft. I've heard you once say, um, in looking back and doing research for this interview, when they were talking about talent and coaches and knowledge, it's like you don't wake up one day and then that guy becomes smarter. Like right. These are people that know the game. Talk to me about this moment that we're in. Why do we think, one – 
it was so hard to get here. And let, let's let's make no bones about it. We're only at five. Yes. We're at, we're at 12 <laughs> right. out of 299 total. We're at five, I believe, outside of HBCUs. So we've got a long way to go. But uh, yeah. we are into, I think, a moment where going into this season, you're hired, Coach Beamer's hired, and, and uh, Marist University, uh, I believe it's Coach Radford, just got hired uh, last month. Why is it now that we're having this moment? And, and wh- why is it taking so long, you think, to get in Division One baseball, to get to where we are? You know what? I, I think it's just one of those things that, um, you know, when you talk about stereotypes, when you talk about expectations, um, and, and when you're asking people to do something different, they're not comfortable with different, right? You know, you um, we, we go through all the George Floyd stuff, and and people are quick to say, well, I don't see color. Well, first of all, it's disrespectful for you to say that you don't see color as a man of color. But second of all, you're lying. You do see color. Right. Because when you when you look at 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 if if we applied for jobs and it was solely resumes with no names and no profiles, how many people of color would have been hired for jobs prior to this point? But the reality of it is, is that's not the case. Um, and and so we have been there have been a handful of us that have been in positions that are qualified for these positions. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know what tripped that trigger, um, but, you know, in, in tr- full transparency, um, that was the one thing that I said to our AD. I said, listen, you have an opportunity if you do choose to hire me to be your next baseball leader to make a statement higher. There's good hires, there's bad hires, there's questionable hires, there's surprising hires. How many people make statement hires? And for him, that's kind of how I laid it out. This is an opportunity to make a statement higher. <clears throat> You're not only telling other ADs in the country that have the potential to have quality baseball programs, hey, this is out there, but you're also saying something about here at Memphis in the community that again is 65% black, you're telling them this is important for me. And I think this is the guy to put in a position that they value um, with regards to where the baseball program can go. Now you are a man that has never shied away from pressure, but given what you just said, um, it is a statement higher. It is something that represents the community in a larger way. It is something that could be potentially a, 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 you know, one of those rocks that breaks the glass ceiling, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Do you feel more pressure in this position than you did ever at Southern or any of the other jobs you ever had? I don't uh, simply from the standpoint. Well, let me rephrase that. I feel the pressure to be successful for who comes behind me. I don't feel the pressure for me myself personally, or the program to be successful, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. What I do know is if I'm not successful, then the narrative is, see, they're not ready. Mm -hmm. It it doesn't, it won't have Mm -hmm. anything to do that he wasn't good enough or, um, you know, but it will be, yeah, see, they gave a coach a chance and they're not ready to coach at this level. So if there's any pressure, it's the pressure to make sure that I continue to do things to put us in a position where then now other ADs say, oh, wait a minute now. We need to go find that guy. Where's where's the next Carrick Jackson? Um, and again, not to put accolades on me specifically, mm-hmm. but just in, in what will be accomplished and what I know that we're going to be capable of here when we reach those heights, then I think that opens up the opportunity for other ADs to look at other minority coaches, specifically black coaches and say, okay, yep, come on, let's go. And it's so true coach. And it's simultaneously in 2022. It's so frustrating, right? Because it's so true. Exactly. Everything you said is facts. And the fact that no other (laughs) kind of ethnic group in this way, and I won't say gender is different because I believe a lot of women feel the same thing, especially if they're pioneering. But you don't go to the number of coaches that we have and say, you know, they are representing an entire body or community or uh, fraternity of coaches. And that has been 
I think the story for me, I'm born and raised in Richmond, Virginia. No matter what I did, my parents told me, hey, you are not only representing yourself, your family, you're representing everybody because yeah. whatever opportunity you have, the next one may not come if 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 it doesn't go well. And Agreed. so 2022, again, we're, we're, we're everybody's trying, I think, in many ways, whether whether uh, honest or not, they're trying to perceive the, the, the fact that we're being more inclusive, more diverse, more tolerant in understanding. And we know that, you know, the, these five that we have now may not be 10 if it doesn't if we don't do what we need to do in that sense. Um, and uh, uh, it, definitely. Coach, let me ask you about because I know that you are a coach first, but we talk. I, I said I wanted to get into the history of you got some names on your resume, coach, that I'm going to be honest. I feel like I'm an astute <laughs> sports. <laughs> I'm an astute sports fan. I know even with junior colleges and division two and, and some of this stuff, I know some of this stuff. But you got some names, coach, on your resume that I, I never heard of the schools, the locations, the towns and <laughs> everywhere you've been uh, at every level up until obviously we'll talk about the turnaround in Southern. Uh, you've been able to, to make it shake. Uh, talk to me about how you just got into coaching, because that has to be especially collegiate coaching has to be very intentional. And then what you were trying to bring at these stops in your coaching journey. No question. I, I think that. Um, you know, I, I finished up and graduated from University of Nebraska. Um, I, you know, I had shoulder surgery. Pro ball wasn't going to be in my future. Um, um, I was an early childhood education, um, special education minor. Um, I, my, my thing was if I didn't play pro ball, I was always going to go out, go out and teach kindergarten. Mm. Um, I, have a, I have a passion for early childhood and that those kids in that in that phase of their lives. I just think they're just they're so fascinating. They're so genuine. Um, and their minds are so open and you can just pour so much into them. Um, and I moved back home to St. Louis, um, got a job as a permanent substitute, um, at a local high school, uh, and started coaching high school baseball and basketball at that time. Um, and, um, I had a, applied to a nanny agency um, when I was at Nebraska based on recommendation from our my, one of my instructors up there and she's like hey you're a male with and you're really good with kids you know you'll be able to command your own dollar amount mm -hmm. um, and so I did that um, had a family reach out to me my grandfather was sick at the time so I passed on the opportunity they stayed in touch and uh, a year later, um, my grandfather passed away. I ended up, uh, they kept, you know, stay in touch with me. They offered me the job. So I moved out to Connecticut and, uh, I'm in Weston, Connecticut, working for a family with two autistic boys. Um, and again, I just come from coaching high school, baseball and basketball, um, the year prior. And so there was an institution, uh, Fairfield University. Um, which was about 15 minutes away from the house. Um, and I asked them, I said, hey, on my off days and in the evenings, if I'm able to go and get involved in coaching, do you have a problem with it? And they said, no. So I reached out to Johnny Slosar, who was the head coach at Fairfield University at that time, um, told him that I was interested in coming up and being part of the staff. And, you know, if there was any opportunity, I'd love to have it. He and I sat down, we talked for probably about three, four hours. He offered me a position. So that was my first coaching position. Um, Fairfield. Yeah. And and the thing that I will say, right, is so we're talking 2000, 2000, 2001, I believe. Okay. This man hires a young black individual, right? I wasn't a coach at that time mm -hmm. to, to assist him at a division one institution in Fairfield, Connecticut. Um, and being there, he let me work with, I was working with the pitchers, um, had some things in place, um, and it just kind of took off from there. Um, and, and I had always been a student of the game, um, even as a player, mm -hmm. uh, because I knew that the potential of coaching someday was going to be there. Um, and so he let me come in there and have some, some free reign to do some things. Um, and it was just, it was just a good environment. 
Um, and we were able to put some things together and, and just kind of jump started it from there. And, um, and then, you know, uh, I think my thing was, I was going to always be where my feet were at. I wasn't ever looking for the next place. Like the moves that I made weren't moves of me job jumping because, Oh, let me look and see here. Let me, it was me being good where I was and people recognizing that. And then me being afforded other opportunities as a result. And that's the one thing I try and tell young coaches all the time is don't keep looking at what the next job is, Mm -hmm. make the current job, the best job and your next job will come as a result. Cause cause that change, that also changes how you move, right? If you're looking Mm -hmm. to constantly go up that ladder, you're not moving the way that you probably need to move to be the best coach that you are in the place that you're at. Yes. Talk to me about Southern. It is at this point. It's mythical <laughs> that this it, was it a two season turnaround where you went from single digit wins to the College World Series. Talk to me about your experience at Southern, coaching at an HBCU, and actually leading that program to the College World Series tournament. Yeah, you know, it was uh, I was I was at the Boris Corp uh, at the time as an agent. We're gonna get um, back to that. That's all. That's all yeah. I love it. you. Drop yeah. these jewels in the, like the side jewels. Yeah. All, yeah. Talk to um, you. But but yeah, going to Southern, you know, again, when you talk about the idea of um, being at an HBCU institution and being able to create more visibility uh, for black coaches and black players, um, obviously, there's no better place to do that than being at an HBCU um, because you have that some of that inherent, um, you know, uh, people that you're working with is built in there. So um you know, it was, it was a tough deal, right? It was, um, they were under NCAA penalties. Um, so we had scholarship reduction. We had no postseason my first year. Um, we had practice uh, limitations and they hadn't had a winning record, I think in the previous seven years. Um, and the last time they went to won a conference championship and went to a regional was 2009, I believe. And, and I got there in the fall of 2017. Um, so um, it was a very interesting deal. Um, when they when they hired me, uh, despite all the things that were in need of repair, they only offered me a two year contract. OK, um, which, you know, when you think about college sports and being able to to do something um, and get something up and going two years, it's unheard of right Mm -hmm. the idea of you know the expect to to have something come in and and be turned around so to speak in a two-year time frame there's no time to recruit because when they when I came on board they hadn't um signed any 2018 grads like they none they had no commitments um (laughs) and so and my wife you know she's like hey are you sure you want to do this and I said yep we'll be fine. I said, I'm, I'm not worried about um, the ability to go in there and be successful. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm good with it. Um, and so, you know, the, I believe that from an administrative standpoint, uh, there, there was a concern that I wasn't going to be there long. Um, and based on my resume and other places I'd been and, you know, um, and as I told our AD, with all due respect, HBCUs are not stepping stone jobs. You don't hear about people, let me go take this job at an HBCU so I can get this other job. That's not what they are, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we built a house in Baton Rouge um, mm-hmm. because I wanted to show what my commitment was uh, to, to staying there and, and making that thing work. Um, and in my first year, um, my first meeting with the team was I told them, I said, listen, we're not going to talk about winning this year because you, no one here has, has been part of a winning program here at at Southern. So to to think that all of a sudden we're going to come in here and we're all automatically going to win, I'm not that good. So we have to look at this from a spectrum. And if the spectrum is A to Z on building a championship caliber program, we will start with A and we won't move on to B until we do A well. And then we'll move on to B. I said, at the end of the year, we only will get to C. But that means we're going to do A, B, and C better than anybody in the country. Um, and so that was the process. And we just started with teaching. And, um, you know, the first two weeks of practice at Southern, all we did was play catch. Hmm. We didn't hit. 
There was no defense because I asked them, I said, tell me what you think about catch play. And they're like, catch play? What are you talking about? I said, playing catch. They're like, well, you play catch to get warm. Wrong answer. I said, playing catch is the most fundamental aspect of the game. Mm. The ability to throw and catch effectively is what allows you to be successful. And so that's what we did for two weeks. All we did was play catch. Um, and we just started doing things a little bit at a time. And, and for me, that's something I always preach is we have to be focused and control the process oriented goals. We can't be locked in on the result driven aspect of things because we can't control that. We can control the process part. Uh, and if we put our emphasis on the process part, the result driven goals, the wins, the championships, the regionals, those will take care of themselves. If you're focused on that and you don't know the path to get there, you'll never reach that. Because at that point, we weren't talented enough that we were just going to go out there and beat anybody. Um, the beauty about that year was, like you said, we only won nine games. But of the 33 losses that we had, 15 of those 33 losses were two runs or less. Mm. For seven innings that year, we could play with anybody in the country. Mm. Anybody in the country. But we had 10 pitchers. I think I had one, maybe two kids that threw over 85 miles an hour and we didn't throw a lot of strikes. And so that in itself is a, a tough hill to climb when you talk about wanting to be successful. Um, and at the end of the year, one of our players um, who had ended up being our, our, a drafted player that next year, he asked me, he said, coach, we only won nine games. He said, you didn't kick a bucket. You ain't cussing nobody. You didn't. He's like, you know, he was like, what? I, I don't understand. I said, I said, JV, and I said, listen, here's the deal. I said, I told you guys from jump, we weren't going to be concerned about winning. And I knew that coming in. So I wasn't worried about it. I said, the win comes in the idea of you guys understanding how to play the game the right way. And I said, we accomplished that goal that everybody we played that year, everybody made the same comment. Wow. This is a completely different team. Mm. You guys play the game the right way. And in time, it's going to be good. And basically, when we rolled to that second year, it was the same guys. We added some arms um, and we added a couple of JUCO transfers in to help us. And we went from nine wins to 34 wins. Coach, you are a man after my own heart because as we speak, I am coaching six, seven, and eight year olds. Oh wow! And I, no, and I say that because again, like you, like we go into a season not not the same caliber clearly, but we say, hey, we're not going to worry about wins. We're going to get better. And throwing and catching, literally throwing and catching at that age, is the most fundamental thing we have to do. Now, unlike you, coach. Uh, I was kicking buckets last night. <laughs> <laughs> I tell myself, hey, look, we're not going to kick buckets. And then the first thing I do, I was like, come on, guys, come on. Because when, when you see a team that you can beat, you know what I mean? You're like, yep, yep. Um, let me ask you this, and then I'll, and I'll switch gears because I, I, I really appreciate everything that you said um, about your time at Southern. Now that you look at HBCUs, and, and, and it's, it, it come, it's cyclical, all of this stuff is cyclical in a sense of, you know, Every couple of years, you try to see a, a new reinvestment in HBCUs across the board. It is starting to feel a little bit different, obviously, in the football realm because you have Deion Sanders, you have Hugh Jackson, you have Eddie George at HBCUs. Do you think those type of high-profile emphasis on athletics and HBCUs, does that change the dynamic a little bit to, to have coaches now say, oh, I'm going to be like – Dion or Eddie George and come to an HBCU, but it is going to be a stepping stone as opposed to I'm going to win where I'm at. So I think we have some time before it becomes a stepping stone, just because you're still asking to be able to, to compete on a national level. Um, and as we all know, that takes resources. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and without the resources, it makes it difficult. Um, you know, I mean, you, you look at us at Southern, um, we hit at a local high school because we didn't have cages mm. um, and we would go and our, our field would flood. Uh, and so we would we would have to go and practice, um, you know, at some local parks and that kind of stuff. But 
at the same time, what I told our guys is we will not be victims of our own circumstance. Like mm. that, that has no bearing on our ability to get better because we still have the opportunity to do so. Is it ideal? No, it's not ideal, but it is what it is. So if you don't like it, well, it's not going to change. So then you probably just need to go someplace else. But I said, if I'm not bitching and complaining about it, and I'm the one that ultimately, you know, my job is the one that's on the line based on whether or not we win or lose, then you shouldn't be complaining about it. And so getting them away from that um, was key. And so I think, like you said, when you, when you talk about these, this movement, if you will, that is happening with um, football, um, I just think it takes resources. I think it takes, you know, the, the one thing um, that that you enjoy about the HBCUs uh, that are out there, they're passionate fan bases. Unfortunately, they're not always passionate with their checkbooks. Um, and 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 so it's you get some people that will be supportive of of athletics and then you get some people that won't. Um, and with the, as many people that are out there, if they if they were able to support with their checkbooks, um, then I think you see something different because when you look at, when you look at the bigger institutions, yes, obviously a, a larger state school has money because they're a larger state school. But when you look at the athletic departments, that comes from donors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that comes from people writing checks. Booster, booster programs. Boosters. And all right, that. right. So, so when you, when you think about coaches being hired and fired, um, at some of these bigger programs, these power five schools after two or three years, that is coming from that donor that wrote that check to say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I'm right. I'm, what am I'm, I spending, for? I'm spending way too much yeah. money. We got to make a change. Right. And so, um, th there is power and money, right. And, right. and at HBCUs, it's, if, if you would get some of those alums, in that same position to understand if you want this winner pitch in. Right. And then if we're not winning at the level that we should be, you now have voice because you're writing a check to support and give the necessary facilities and make sure the kids have what they need from an equipment standpoint and nutritional standpoint and trainers and weight room and all those types of things, as opposed to, this ideology of, well, we were successful such and such. Well, that was a while ago um, and things are different now and kids want more now. And so, again, it doesn't have to have all the glitz and glamour, but at least it's got to be functional. It's got to be in a situation where they have an opportunity to develop and get better. So talk to me, because that approach at Southern was 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 right on, spot on. At Memphis, it's a different caliber of league like you've already said it's it's basically a power five with with teams like east carolina mm -hmm. at the top in the american the talent the, the the caliber of player i'm assuming that you would get a little bit more sought after to to get there so you're coming into a program that and also a program that that let's be frank was it's not the it's not the bottom of the league it's i mean it's i mean it's not the bare bottom of the league it's right there's work to be done but it's it, you're not you know, inheriting a program that doesn't have some good structure there in that sense. Do you take the same approach in coming coming to Memphis and saying these this is we're we're at step A to get to step Z of a championship? Or do you look at what you have at, at Memphis, players, caliber, resources, coaches, staff that you built and say, hey, we may be at C as opposed to A? The, the mindset is the same, the evaluation right, is what determines where the starting point is. So you're exactly right. Um, but the mindset is still the same, right? It, it's it's a situation where we have guys here. Um, you've never won a championship. Mm. You, you haven't been to a regional. Um, and, and so being able to stand on this side and say, I've been to multiple regionals. I've won multiple championships. I know what it looks like. Um, and so here are the things that are going to be necessary for us to be able to make those things happen. So, yes, I think the the mindset is the same, but we can start the conversation uh, a little bit further along. Um, but at the end of the day, the process is still going to be the same. We have to be able to have a high attention to detail and we have to put ourselves in a position where we go out and play the game the right way. And we're not chasing numbers and we're not worried about the wins and the losses at the end. It's the evaluation has to come from 
did we play the game well today? Did we throw strikes? Did we have quality at bats? Did we play good defense? You know, did we run the bases well? And if we did and we didn't come up with a W, well, then you tip your hat to the other team because they just played better than us. Um, but if we do that consistently and we can sit back at the end of games and say, hey, you know what? We played well. Odds are going to be in our favor that we're going to come out on the winning end of things. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Coach Jackson. He is the head coach of Memphis baseball. Let's let's switch gears a little bit simply because we talked like we could talk about current baseball and, and Memphis and all the things we could talk about. Obviously, your history, which is is amazing at a very short amount of time, because, look, Coach Jackson, you're not that old. Let's just face it. You're, You're right. not that old to have this uh, expansive career. I do want to talk about um, two uh, times that you're away from actually coaching because it adds to the conversation of diversifying the game and diverse and seeing actually three. There was a time where you were a major league baseball scout. There was a time where you were a, a baseball agent. And then just recently uh, prior to taking this job, you headed the, the major league baseball draft. Those three positions inside the game, but very unique. And when we talk about increasing the numbers of black players in the game, black coaches in the game, black administrators in the game, um, those I think those three roles are roles that allow you to see things that other people can't see or won't see or haven't had the opportunity to see. So in, in a weird way of me asking, in those roles outside of coaching, in those high-profile roles, what have you seen that can, you know, give you unique perspective into increasing the diversity of the game? For sure. I, I think you have to first start with those different positions, giving you different perspective, right? They all have their viewpoints uh, from a, a different lens, if you will, looking at the same thing, but just looking at it through a different lens as a scout, looking at it through an evaluation, looking for the next big leaguer type piece, as an agent looking for the next big leaguer that you believe has that inherent value. Um, and you know that those kids are going to get to the big leagues, right? I think scouts sometimes as scouts, um, we were challenged with finding the next big leaguers, but at the end of the day, prior to them changing the draft, you had 40 rounds of the draft. The numbers already told you that, those dudes, the percentage of them making to the big leagues are slim. So then now when you go to the agent side, now your that scope becomes a lot tighter than it does even as an agent because as a or I'm sorry, as a scout, because as a scout, you're challenged also with filling rosters um, with guys that are going to be or guys in that type of field. As an agent, it's, hey, we're trying to find this guy that we believe is going to get through arbitration and get to that 10-year multi you know, contract. Oh, man. Um, and so, and being able to help them navigate that. And then when you look at the idea of actually running a league, um, now you factor in all of those things. And specifically mm. with the draft league, we had to find draftable players that had a high level of ability um, that were also obviously um, their skill level matched and were talented that were going to come there and ultimately end up being draft picks to then go on. And then the, the other pieces of, you know, the financial aspect of things and dealing with the GMs and the owners and, you know, where their mind was versus the fact that we had amateur kids and what is in the best interest of amateur kids. And so, yeah, it, it all just gives you, uh, again, the simplicity of it is you're all looking at the same thing. We're working in the same game, but there's different viewpoints. And so being able to have those different viewpoints and understanding uh, of all those coaching, scouting, agent, um, and and president of a league, it, it did give me some very unique experiences and, and increased the knowledge base that I have because I at this point I'm in a position where I do understand all aspects of the game um, and, and from practical application. Let me ask this in this way. How do we get more black players, black American players, to play college baseball and ultimately in the Major League Baseball system? So I, I think it starts with being able to put our young black kids in a position where they receive quality coaching at that six through nine, six through 10 age range. You know what you're talking about right now. Um, if you go into 
predominantly black community and you took a, a 10 U AAU basketball team, a 10 U JFL football team and a 10 U baseball team, the expertise from a coaching standpoint in basketball and football will far outweigh that in baseball on average, right? There's some places out there where you have some quality youth baseball coaches, but across the country on average, it doesn't exist, right? And so you have places where there are people that are coaching baseball because they're knowledgeable. They're knowledgeable. Um, well, let me say this. They are vested in the community. They have some coaching understanding, but they don't understand baseball. So what quality of instruction are they getting? Mm -hmm. And with this game being a game of failure, and understanding what your place is in the game, if you don't have the proper instruction, you can't be expected to go out and be successful because you don't know what success is in the game of baseball. Success in the game of basketball is very, very simple. How many points did you score? How many rebounds did you have? How many assists, block shots, whatever? Success in football, very simple. How many tackles did you have on defense? If you're a cornerback, how many interceptions? How many balls did you knock down? Right. Um, how many touchdowns you score? How many yards? How many passes? Right. right. Those are cut dry in baseball. You went over three today, but I had three quality at bats. Successful day. That's progress. Yep. W- well, what do you mean it's a successful day? I didn't get any hits today, but you had three quality at bats. Well, what's the quality at bat? Hey, I'm on defense today. I didn't get one ball hit to me, but th- but I backed up it or did whatever. Well, how did I have a successful day? Because you were in the right positions. You took a backup uh, and an overthrow. You're in the right position to keep that overthrow and keep the guy from advancing the base. The ball that was hit to you in the outfield, instead of trying to throw the guy out that was going first to third, you threw the ball to second base, kept the double play in order. Next pitch was a ground ball double play. We got out of the inning with no run scored. You weren't directly involved in the play, but you were directly involved in that situation that allowed us to get out of that without any runs being scored. And the name of the game in baseball is scoring runs. And if you can keep the other team from scoring them, it's just as important as you scoring the runs yourself. Right. But if if we don't have that knowledge base and understanding, then you can't ask our kids to go out um, and be successful and specifically in what at this point is considered to be a predominantly white sport. Mm -hmm. So you want me to go out as a young black player in a predominantly white sport where I'm going to be one or two or three black players on the field in a game that's built around failure and not be successful in front of a bunch of white folks. Now I'm good on that. I'll go do something else. I agree with you 100%. Let me ask this because uh, I want to be respectful for your time, and I've got a couple couple things I want to hit. How do we get more Coach Jacksons? Now, and again, your path is very unique, but how do we get more uh, diversity in, you know, co- collegiate baseball in general? How do we get more assistance? Because one thing we didn't talk about really quickly is I know that time, look, <laughs> sports agents, especially in baseball, are broke for a long time. They gotta wait. They gotta <laughs> wait to to, yeah. to take a take a chance on a young exceptional talent. Hopefully everything goes well. And like you said, get to that second con not the first contract, but get to that second contract on a on a 40 man roster. Baseball agents are, are broke for longer than most any other agents in the world. For um, sure. How do we get more uh black coaches in the collegiate level? Um because colleges are different, man. Uh, a lot of them, you know, you're hiring alumni, you're hiring people that are close to the program. It's 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 very difficult, even if you had success from another program, to get that opportunity. Well, what needs to happen there to increase those numbers? Well, I, I think you have to look at uh, those of us who are in a position to hire minority coaches. Uh, and those of us who are in visibility positions to hire minority coaches uh, and and make sure that we're doing the things necessary to provide opportunities for growth and development, uh, be it graduate assistance, be it taking some of the young players that come out of our programs uh, that aren't going to play professional baseball but want to get into coaching and getting them in right away as grad assistants or undergraduate assistants if they still have um, to 
time for their degrees, volunteer assistance, um, you know, to, to get people to kind of work their way up. Um, you know, when you when you look at my path um, and, and I have players tell me all the time that they want to coach, one of the things I tell them, make sure you understand what this is. Right. This isn't a cool job. There is things that are involved. So it's in sort of cool. Yes. Sort of but cool. but if but if you look at it only for that, you're missing it. Right. right. If you right. if you don't understand the responsibility that is there for us as coaches, with doing this and you just see it as well, as opposed to going and working a desk job, I get to coach, then I'm going to go coach instead. Mm-hmm. Um, I tell guys all the time, I didn't make more than $10,000 a year for the first time until I was 30. I lived in dorms, making $5,000 a year and a meal card and living in a college dorm, a junior college dorm at that. Um, and, but I wouldn't do it any different. I was never unhappy. Um, You know, when you grow up broke, um, everything that you get past broke um, is, is good. It's a good day. It's a, it's a good day. (laughs) Um, And so, so you don't get caught up into the idea of the finances and what that looks like. And so, so I think, yeah, it's just us as, as coaches that are in these positions that are minority coaches, making sure that we're creating opportunities for young minority coaches and giving them the understanding of this is not an easy road, right? Like don't, don't look at where I am now and think, okay, well, that's what I want to do. Okay. That's great. But look at the 24 year history uh, and and path that I had to take to get to this point and, and and understand that if, if you really want it, then there's going to have to be some grind mentality with regards to that. And it's not going to be glamorous. And if you can't do that, then, Maybe it's not for you, and that's okay because it's not for everybody. No, I, I appreciate the answer. I also have this thing in me that says we need to push back a little bit because this is not a problem that was created by black people. It was a correct. Right. It was a problem created by the lack of black people involved, and so it can't be on Coach Jackson or Coach Thompson or Coach Beamer to be the person solely responsible for hiring you know, young black coaches, and they should in many ways, but they are, you know, 299 programs. You talk about 12 coaches. They can't be on 12 of them to fix this problem. There right, has to be white, right. you know, white ADs, white coaches at predominantly white institutions that are willing to make those statement hires, like you said, and help turn this thing in a direction that, you know, I, I always, you know, joke around about the high water mark of uh, Major League Baseball in the '80s was twenty percent. Where you know, like, we're not going to take all the jobs, <laughs> but if we can get closer to, you know, beyond three, I would feel a lot right. better than that. Uh, Coach- well, I, I, I oh. think it's, I think it's one of those things too. When you know, just like everything else, unfortunately, sure. when it comes to to being minorities and specifically being, being black folks we are challenged and charged with the idea of educating those non-minorities on how they need to go about it. Right. And so as, as like you said, you're right, we shouldn't have to, but if we don't, who is, who is, who is, let me ask you this. And I, and I am going to get you out of here, coach. I really, really appreciate it. I got a couple more quick ones that are fun. Yep. Um, What should people expect when they uh, watch Memphis baseball this year? I think that at the end of the day, we're going to go out and we're going to get after it, right? Um, we're going to be competitive. Um, we're going to play the game clean. We're going to play the game hard um, and put ourselves in a position uh, to be successful more times than not. Um, I, I like our kids. I think we have a, a a group of kids that has a high level of ability, um, and we're just we're just we just need to change the culture and and change the mindset. And I think uh, the sooner they adapt to that, the the, the sooner we're going to be successful. Define a Coach Jackson player. So if you yeah maybe somebody that's uh, in high school looking to come, what's the type of athlete, baseball player, kid that you're looking for to bring into your program? First and first and foremost, like you said, I think we we start with athlete, right? Um, because when you see a player, you don't know about makeup, right? So we all, as coaches, want to say character and makeup, but you don't look on the field and see somebody and say that guy has good character and makeup. So when you're just evaluating and looking, you're talking about kids being athletic. Um, and then after we see that athleticism uh, and know that, that it's there, then you want um, 
a certain level of ability and skill level um, with regards to how it pertains to baseball. Um, and, and then not last um, by any man, um, a stretch of the imagination. We want quality character, right? Like I, I want kids that understand that we're going to do something um, we're going to do things the right way and we're going to do them to the best of our ability. Um, as I tell people all the time, when we go through the recruiting aspect of this thing, if you're looking for a baseball experience, go someplace else. This is a whole life experience that involves baseball. It's not a baseball experience that everything else is part of it. No, nope. this is whole life and baseball is a part of that whole life experience. So this is going to be about helping you grow and mature as a young man and being a responsible, accountable uh, individual and making sure that we're putting you in a position to do the right things. If you just want to go someplace and pay, play baseball, don't come here. That's not what this will be. But if you understand what we're about, this will be the best experience of your entire life besides getting married, having your first child or getting drafted. And, and I if, like if that. kids, I yeah, like kids who understand experience. that, yeah, kids who understand that this will be an awesome experience. If you don't, it's just not the place for you, and I'm okay with that. Growing up, who were the uh, you were you were a pitcher? Growing up, who were the baseball players that you, you was must see TV for you? Who who'd you like? Who who's the posters on your wall? So uh, growing up, I didn't pitch. Um, I was an outfielder, and okay. once I got to ju- once I got to junior college, uh, I was a two way guy there, and then I converted over, um, but. Um, I was, a, I'm from St. Louis, big Cardinals fan. So obviously Ozzie Smith, uh, Willie ah. McGee, um, you know, uh, that, that whole Felix Jose, who that's a name that most people don't know, but that was, that dude was one of my favorites. Um, you know, playing with ball in the backyard, we, we'd imitate walking in Andahar. Um, and you know, just, and, and that's, you know, when you look at it, like that, those are things that kids just don't do anymore. They don't watch the game no, just to watch it. No. And then they don't go out and play unless it's organized. So there are no wiffle ball games or cork ball games, or, you know, kids understand what Indian ball is or any of those right. kind of things. Um, but yeah, anybody, anybody that was a Cardinal, um, th- those are, those are my favorites. Do you really be- – well, all right, I'll 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 save this one question for last. This will be the second to last question because and uh, later in life you developed to be a pitcher. If you could face any hitter in the, the history of baseball as a pitcher, who do you want to face as a hitter? I mean, who do you want to pitch to and face see if you can get him out? Uh, it would probably be Pujols. No, um, <laughs> these answers are amazing. <laughs> Coach, yeah. Coach Beamer said he'd want to face Bob Gibson, and you're saying you want to pitch against Albert Pujols. What are you guys? You guys are masochists at this point. Well, well, and, and as a hitter, that's I would want to face Bob Gibson. You guys are, I, you so, guys are crazy. You guys are crazy. We have, we have, we have two dogs. Uh, they're <laughs> Chocolate Labs, and, and their names are Satchel and Gibson. Oh man, oh man, but Pujols would be a tough. It'd be a tough, tough out. Uh, and then the last thing I'll ask you in today's game, because I heard we talk about this in the past. In today's game, do you really don't think Vince Coleman can, can find a roster spot? What? When you look, when you look at it, what? when you look at it, right? When you look at it, think oh. and think about it. Oh. The way that the way that things are going now, right? HBCUs aren't heavily recruited and scouted, um, and the numbers are always now that we're this era of data and all this there's not a lot of data out there on hbcus they don't hbcus don't have track man right and if they play someplace where they do have it are you getting what you need um and so what happens with a lot of these kids is hbcu scouts will go in and watch southern play lsu on a tuesday night and we'll lose 10 to 6 and walk away and say they don't have anybody that can play we had a center fielder his name was jamie williams left-handed hitter six four runner 60 defender with bad routes in the outfield. The bat was light, um, but he, this dude had all the tools that you needed anybody to have. And he ended up getting drafted by the giants, but didn't last very long. And where the boat was missed on him was again, here's a pure athlete, pure athlete. And we all know that with pure athletes, if given the right amount of time, a pure athlete, can do anything that you ask them to do. So what frustrates me as a coach is specifically when we talk about this lack of black players in the game today, we have all these layer levels of development. What are we doing? 
Why are we right. taking pure athletes and cutting them loose Unless after shorter? Yeah, a 200, 200 at bats to say, now nah, this guy's not good enough. Wait a minute now. So, yes, to, to your question, I Ugh. still believe Ugh. no, Vince, Co- Vince Coleman. Ugh. I don't know if he, I don't know if he plays and gets the I don't know if he gets the opportunity. Right. The latitude. Play. Yes. Because you hear yes. these stories all the time. Like, um, obviously, we knew. I, I just it's fresh in my mind because I just watched the Derek Jeter series and we knew he was a top notch prospect, but he's he was horrible. His first yep. like year in the minor leagues. I'm reading the Ricky Henderson book and and you know Ricky Henderson was a great baseball player. He's also a great football player, but he struggled early on in some of those you know in those minor leagues. Hey, just that you know again, these are athletes that were you know you turn them loose. And, and but I can't I can't imagine like I'm looking at Vince Coleman, Tim Raines, Ricky Henderson. Now the game is so different that I I think it was it's it's it was August first, and I think I saw a stat that said Ricky Henderson had already stolen a hundred bases on August first, um, and he had you know a whole you know he finished with like one thirty seven or something like that, but he had like a whole month and a half left in the season. And I'm sitting here, and I looked. So at the time, I looked at the leading base stealers in MLB, and I think we were at 29. <laughs> he had 100, and they had 29. Right. So it's so, like, so, okay, well, coach. Well, here, here's yeah, no, here's the other thing that when you look back at that time frame, at that time, those owners' main focus was winning. True. They they weren't. It, did they want to make money? Of course, they want to make money. But they wanted to win more than they wanted to make money because they wanted to sit around in that old boys club and say, my team beat your team. Right. Now that doesn't exist. Yeah. You have you have billionaires that own teams that because they're billionaires, this is their cup change in their car that allowed them to buy a sports franchise. Oh. And so when you do come across these owners, um, you know, you look at the Mets, you look at the Yankees, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're going to win at all costs. I'm not worried about what the th- – there's a there's a correlation between winning and revenue. Sure. No, absolutely. <laughs> a, absolutely. A, a losing team doesn't, doesn't make revenue. And so that's why I think back in the day it was okay because you wanted to win. So you saw these super athletes because you can – there's athletes to, in today's game and kids that are coming up that are better athletes than Ricky Henderson or Vince Coleman, Right. So, so just sliding the scale prospectively, we're saying you're dealing with a better athlete and we want to say that though, that's why I think that they're just not going to get the time. I no. need you to be in the big leagues at 21 years old sure. so we can maximize the, your premium level of play at the lowest dollar amount. And so, yeah, it, it, until they change that. And I even asked, that was an advantage I had with being the president of draft league and being able to talk to, some scouting directors and player development directors. And, and my, my one thing to them, I said, we talk about this lack of black players in the game, draft the best athlete in the draft every year and don't put a clock on them. Mm. Coach. Just, just let them play. We are going to have to leave it there. This is phenomenal. I could go on all day, but I want to thank you for your time. I'm very, very excited about Memphis baseball this season and what what you're going to do. So we will be following as closely as possible you uh you have a Twitter account. You're active on it. Where can people follow the program and follow yourself? So yeah, I'm bad about social media uh, when it comes to that. So I'm on coach. Um, gonna be yeah, gonna yeah. Home. I, Is that how you connect to the kids. Yeah, I I, I do know that. Um, I have to tell you, I our uh, mine is that I'm that dad, KJ. Um, All right. Our, and then our uh, Memphis baseball Twitter is uh, at Memphis baseball. Coach, this has been a real pleasure. Best of luck as you continue the season. This is the Black Baseball Mixtape. And until next time, another edition of Mixtape Talk in the books. Catch you next time.